but I have confidence that they'll eventually get things under control and inflation will start to taper off. So given that the funds rate is going to continue to increase with their funds rate target, or at least the inflation target at 2%, they're going to eventually drop the funds rate. So buying in a higher interest rate environment today, if you can buy an asset that cash flows today, that is opportune because as the interest rates decrease in the future, now you have an opportunity to either refinance or sell the asset in an opportune environment to a buyer that's willing to pay your price on the exit. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required, hosted by LBW. This podcast is intended for free thinkers, entrepreneurs, and knowledge seekers. Join us as we discuss relevant financial topics, explore with guests their financial journeys, and engage with experts in industries such as space, media and entertainment, real estate, and many more. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. I do have a question for you, Giorgio. Out of, out of curiosity, we've been talking about at least for more primary residence um, perspective, but I'm also curious on the commercial side and what the investments you're looking at is mm-hmm. what we've noticed, at least in the in the um, primary home market, that interest rates have risen significantly, but asset prices haven't quite seen the decrease yet. So Dan, uh, our my business partner, obviously had a really good saying. He's like, we're in purgatory. <laughs> like It's like this purgatory <laughs> moment where it's like, the you know the interest rates are high and you're also getting it at that price where it was at three yeah. percent instead of six percent right mm-hmm. are you guys seeing that currently in the market where the environment hasn't changed it's changed rapidly but the prices haven't come down to make now where interest rates are currently at if we're going to go lever a property to make it make sense for the purchase price are we still kind of need prices to come down in your opinion obviously you've mentioned you found a few deals but do you feel like those deals are only going to increase as the environment starts to see that decrease in, in, in purchase price um, with the increase in, in rates. Yeah, I think you're spot on. So um, to, to walk you back to earlier this year and what we kind of experienced. So I would say interest rates really started to tick up in February and March of this year. And I would say March through probably about June, there was a lot of price discovery with, uh, or actually this is pre-price discovery. So there was a lot of, um, to what you mentioned, sellers, they, they want this price, even though interest rates went here, they said, hey, nope, I want my price. And then June to probably August, there was that's when the price discovery started to come into place to where owners were realizing, okay, we're in this higher interest rate environment. If I want to sell my property or if I have to sell my property, I'm unfortunately going to have to come down on that price. And so there was a lot of negotiation and some people were willing to come down on the price. And other owners weren't willing to come down on their price, so they just didn't sell their assets. Yeah. And so uh, there was a lot of that. And now I still think that we're still in this price discovery phase, but there's also been a lot of capitulation in the market. So uh, there's been owners that are are realizing, okay, we're in a tighter interest rate environment. The Fed's going to continue to hike rates, maybe at a decreased interval. However, rates are still going to be high for a bit of time. And so I, I know that I, I can't sell my asset for as much. And I'm okay with that because I've overproduced on the return that I was expecting. Uh, so we're seeing owners that, again, are willing to sell and accept a lower price. But then there's a lot of owners that still haven't uh, come to a decision on whether they are, are comfortable with, with selling at a reduced price. So a little bit of price discovery is still present in the marketplace. Do you, and in your opinion, Giorgio, do you believe that going forward in the real estate market, because a lot of people may think counterintuitively, right? interest rates are high, get away from trying to acquire real estate, right? Because it's more costly. It's not as effective. But do you feel like this this environment is going to create more opportunity to actually get into better deals than let's say, you know, 12 months ago, November of 2021, where the market was rip roaring, you know, and then it was, you know, people were getting the prices in which they wanted to sell at? Or do you feel mm-hmm. like it's going to start coming in where you where you and MLG Capital can actually find deals in which you're feeling pretty comfortable with? Or is it going to take some time for really it to, uh, it to get there? And I would say yeah. the volume of deals, I should probably say, might be a, a component of that of that question. Yeah, and I'll I'll talk on the the volume of deals standpoint. So it used to take us looking at maybe sixty to eighty deals in order to find one that works from our investment return metrics standpoint. Mm-hmm. But now it's taking us one hundred and twenty deals or more 
to look at to find again one deal that might make sense from an investment standpoint. So to your point, a lot less deals in the marketplace make sense. Um, so it's a lot harder to find great real estate transactions. Um, when you're acquiring at this higher price point, it's a lot more risky, right? Mm-hmm. So um, you have to be evaluating and being more conservative on the assumptions that you're u- using in your financial model, right? Because higher risk environment, higher debt service, to your point, less NOI. But if you're cash flowing at a higher interest rate environment, especially given we know that the Fed long term wants to be at a 2% rate, right? They want to bring inflation down to 2%. So ultimately, long-term thesis, and this might be 2024, 2025, 2026, but we know that the Fed target rate is lower than where it is today. And so interest rates are going to go up. If you can buy and deals are cash flowing day one when you buy them, then you'll be able to essentially take advantage, exactly, refinance or sell off the assets in a more opportune rate environment. So a buyer is more comfortable paying your ask price because mm-hmm. it's a lower interest rate environment. So that's kind of where we are today there. And then uh, I think that there's a lot of people, again, that have used so many risky debt products in the market that like they're going to get caught in this this conundrum to where, yeah, they're, they're refinancing into this higher interest rate environment. And so to your point, you're going to be able to get assets at a steep discount. Yeah. So, um, I, and I don't know how to convey that because I obviously don't want to uh, overinflate uh, expectations, but uh, it is a very exciting time when there's, it's kind of like, what does uh, Warren Buffett say? Um, when people are greedy, f- uh, be fearful. Yeah. If people are fearful, be greedy. <laughs> yeah. And then like when the tide goes out, you get to see oh. who's swimming naked. Like there's so many like quotes like that, but like it all totally makes sense when you like zoom out. And as long as you're making sound investment decisions from a conservative lens, I feel like you're going to be just fine. Yeah, um, and it's, and it's all about the it's all about the price you pay. That's the most important part. Absolutely. Right. So, Giorgio, that's really interesting. And and what I want to ask you too is, when it comes to this higher rate environment, right? Uh, it's creating a different like this difference in the market, like we've been talking about. It's creating new information. And what I'm curious about is that a lot of people like maybe counterintuitively will say, look, rates are going up. Maybe it's not the best time to buy real estate with rising rates, right? It's it's more it's more costly to service your debt, which means you need to have maybe bigger revenue numbers to be able to support said cost of debt. Um, but I, w- I just want to hear from your opinion. Is that what you're seeing? Is that are you seeing actually better deals? Because even though that you may be higher cost of debt, are the prices coming down to a point where they become extremely attractive relative to the other route, right? Where interest rates were low and prices were high. Like how is this affecting your deal flow? And are you mm-hmm. feeling excited about actually increased rates or is it, do you feel like it's creating more risk um, going into these type of deals? I love this question. And there's, there's so many dynamics to it. Um, so I'll try to attack them kind of one by one. The first being, the competition, right? So rising interest rate environments have sidelined probably 80 to 90% of the competition. So but just from a competition point in general, most people are out of the market. So it allows you to, to have a good look at everything that's in the marketplace <laughs> without as many people bidding on the available offerings. So that's kind of the first dynamic. The next Gives you one some breathing being, room to actually make a deal. <laughs> Exactly. To negotiate the deal and to get it at the right price. And to that point, we are starting to see sellers come down on price. Again, not everyone, like we mentioned before, but some sellers are willing to accept a lower price. And so it's a negotiation. But what we're doing as a firm is we're, we've always been conservative in our underwriting. However, in times like these, we're being extra conservative. So uh, I'll just give you an example. If we're, we typically are buying large apartment complexes and large industrial facilities, but for an apartment, it's really easy to understand. Maybe um, an owner of an apartment complex is currently getting today on their renovated units a $200 premium over their classic units, meaning unrenovated units. Well, maybe they've achieved that across 20% of their units. So let's say 40 units on a 200 unit apartment complex. So 40% of the property is achieving this $200 premium. If we're looking to acquire that property, the beautiful thing is that rent premium has already been proved out. 
So that investment thesis is sound. Maybe it's in a, in a great location, but external to all those other components, let's just look at the rental property itself. So what we're assuming going in to acquire this apartment complex is we'll say, maybe they took $10,000 to renovate that unit to make it a premium, but we're going to assume that we're going to put in $12,000. Again, we're in an inflationary environment, and also we want to be a bit more conservative, and we're going to achieve a lower premium than what they're achieving today. So they're achieving $200 today. It took them $10,000 to achieve that $200 premium. Well, now we're assuming it's going to take us $12,000 to achieve maybe $150 premium. So conservative in that lens, and now that gives us the opportunity to, when we're looking at uh, acquiring an asset in this environment with this conservative lens, does it still meet our returns at a given price point? And if not, we pass on it. So again, we have to look at a lot of deals until we find one that makes sense. And then if we do find that one that makes sense and the owner is willing to accept this price, then we're able to transact at that price. Uh, so it makes us extremely excited to talk about acquiring assets in this environment with less competition. Plus, in a higher interest rate environment, you kind of have to zoom out and look at the macro trend of where we're heading in the future. And so if we think about what the Fed is doing uh, or what their plans are, uh, you see that they say, at least from their, their notes and uh, the last few meetings, that they plan to have a, about a 2% target inflation rate. And I think that's going to be extremely difficult to create. So I don't think that that happens next year in 2023. It maybe doesn't even happen in 2024. But I have confidence that they'll eventually get things under control and inflation will start to taper off. So given that the funds rate is going to continue to increase with their funds rate target, or at least the inflation target at 2%, they're going to eventually drop the funds rate. So buying in a higher interest rate environment today, if you can buy an asset that cap flows today, that is opportune because as the interest rates decrease in the future, now you have an opportunity to either refinance or sell the asset in an opportune environment to a buyer that's willing to pay your price on the exit. So it's a, in, in our opinion and with our thesis, I think it's a, it's a very exciting time to buy. Definitely, it's, it's not one for the faint of heart, but uh, for those that know what they're doing, know how to analyze and know exactly what they're looking for, I think it's a, a very opportune time to buy. Very interesting. I mean, and what I what I love about that, which is, again, consistency throughout this podcast is time, right, is you can't plan on when the Fed's going to do something or not do something. But if you do have enough time to allow that thesis to play out, because most likely I do agree with you, the target is 2%, they'll probably bring it back down. You can then, you know, depending on how what probability you want to put on that bet, but it is a probably a pretty sound bet to have that and then be able to maximize that opportunity in today's environment, even though it seems very difficult because things seem to be going, you know, down. Uh, you know, we were talking off screen, Giorgio, it's like, look, all tides lift all boats, but when the tides go back out, you can find the people who are naked, right? And and are now exactly. need to be able to get, hey, I, I, I need to get out of this. And you can start taking necessarily advantage or, you know, looking at those opportunities for your investors, which is which is really awesome. Now I got one more question for you before we before we sum this all up. We talked a lot about like the advantages kind of throughout this podcast of real estate it creates diversification. It creates potential cash flow of income. Um, I am curious on on your end when it comes to the risks of real estate, and you've kind of highlighted this a little bit throughout some of the conversation that we just had. But just to kind of pinpoint it, what risks do people need to be aware of when it comes to real estate, um, and what attention needs to really be uh, focused on? Um, in order so that you don't get yourself in a situation where you're that person standing in the tide naked. Um, what are the, some of the, just the really high level core components of that, that you would, that you would suggest or, or suggest to emphasize? Yeah. So I think um, there's a number of facets that you need to look at and it depends on whether you're actively investing or passively investing. And me and my wife, we do both. So we both have a passive portfolio and an active real estate investment portfolio. And so um I think there's three core components when you're investing in real estate that you should be looking at. And they're mainly correlated with the assumptions as you're doing the financial analysis of a potential opportunity. So you have to look at the core assumptions around what growth you're anticipating. And this can be growth from an appreciation standpoint or in a rental property, um, an income standpoint. So what growth you have 
uh, or what growth assumptions do you have in your portfolio? The next component is going to be the debt. So what kind of debt are you using on the asset? And when you're modeling that debt, again, everything has to be, in my opinion, to in, especially in order to kind of weather the times that we're in today, I think you have to underwrite to a cash flow positive day one, right? So you're stepping into cash flow day one with reasonable and achievable assumptions in your financial model. And you have to model realistic debt in the higher interest rate environment. As, mm -hmm. And lastly, you have to be thinking about the exit strategy. So if you're actively investing, are you just going to invest in this asset and hold it forever and never sell? Well, there's a lot of risk involved with that, right? Because you then have to budget in, okay, replacing a roof and a furnace and an AC unit. And so all of these components that will break over time as you hold it forever, right? So that changes how you're going to model it. But maybe you only hold it for five years. What does the environment look like in five years? How much has it appreciated? How much have rents gone up, et cetera? Who's going to sell it? Uh, are you going to sell it on your own? Or are you going to hire a brokerage to sell it? So active side, right? You have to be thinking about all these things. Passive side, well, this is where you are vetting a manager that has great experience, right? So they have a long track record showing that they have weathered bad times, right? Maybe the 2001 um, um, stock bubble, right? Dot-com bubble. Uh, maybe it's the great financial crisis of 08, 09. Um, if they've gone through tough times and they've prevailed, then that might be a, a group that's, that's worth entrusting on the, for you to be a limited partner or a passive investor with. Uh, but you're, again, when you're looking at a passive opportunity, you're still vetting the assumptions. If it's an individual deal or uh, a group, you're looking at their investment thesis and their, their philosophy and saying, okay, I think that philosophy is sound. So I'm going to entrust in that. There always has to be an exit strategy. And then with any investment during the financial analysis, you're always looking at the assumptions. So there's a lot to that, but uh, I would say that those are the the key components of, of risk to really get tapped into. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. That that's excellent, and it, and it's a lot, and I'm glad that you kind of laid it out that way because if someone is interested in going and doing it them on themselves, that's just something that you kind of have to learn and, and know about. Kind of like you're talking about, Georgia, it's comparing what you're currently doing and the time worth, like. You can definitely learn all this stuff, but you got to put the work in in order to learn it to do the appropriate due diligence because um, you can Absolutely. you can make you can make mistakes, which could be uh, unfortunate for the household or for yourself or wherever, whoever it may be. Um, so we're coming up to the end of the podcast. We always like to give final thoughts to our guests. So I'm going to give you the final thoughts, but I'll start off. There's just a few things I, I really appreciated uh, about this podcast. I wanted to highlight one is there is always a correlation or at least a a uh, a thread throughout this entire thing about time right? You just mentioned it. What I absolutely love. And you're like, you also have to think about your exit. Um, we were told by somebody a while back that uh, from a business perspective, it's easy to start a business. It's really hard to get out, right? Um, it's very similar to this. It's easy to buy a property, but sometimes it can be really hard to get out. So having an exit strategy and understanding that is so key, because what I also like about it is it puts a time frame on it. And that time frame can then be extremely uh, impactful when it comes to how you maneuver that deal or how you underwrite it. Uh, time is extremely important. If you're going to hold it onto it forever, well, then you're going to watch the Fed go through multiple waves of interest rates, right? So you have to put as much emphasis on that. You're going to have to think about it as much, right? You can catch it at different times. You can position yourself. But if you need to be out of this property because you need the liquidity, as you mentioned in the podcast, then you really need to start thinking about how to get out of that deal and what does that look like? And do you get caught in at the wrong time? Which if you get caught in the wrong time, you might have Giorgio coming to buy your property. Um, <laughs> so it just depends on, on the situation, but it is really interesting. And I think the biggest overall reaching outside of time is competency. It's not that people can't do this, right? You can read the books, you can you know teach yourself, but it's timing how much. And I do believe that real estate also is very micro right? You can go from street to street from family, you know, single family homes, same with apartments, understanding the location. It would be very hard for me to go and try to buy something in Texas. I don't know anything about Texas or the neighborhoods or where it may be. So if you're looking to expand and do that, it is sometimes beneficial to find people who have done it and done it well within their circle of competence um, and to be able to kind of maneuver that or pass on some of that time 
to make some of those investments. So time, competency, um, both time on investment, time for yourself to be able to do that investment. And then do you really understand what you're trying to buy and why um, is, is always a really, really key component when it comes to building a real estate portfolio, both active, as Giorgio said, or passive, um, which is interesting. So that's, I really do appreciate your time, Georgia, but I want to hear what you have uh, to kind of sum up our conversation. Uh, so please, by all means. I love it. So um, I'll sum up. We, we started talking about asset allocation. I think real estate is a great way to diversify your portfolio. Again, not with all of your portfolio, but maybe a portion of your portfolio, because it gives you some, some uh, asset allocation that's not correlated to public equities. Um, and then, so we talked about the benefits of real estate. So we talked about cash flow. So you're getting current cash flow or dividends in your bank account on a monthly or quarterly basis, which is beneficial. But there's other benefits as well that we didn't necessarily dive into, but there's the tax benefits, right? So uh, most people that own a single family home understand the benefit of depreciation, right? So the government says that your house is depreciated over 27 and a half years. And so you take the depreciable basis, you divide it by 27 and a half years, and you get that tax benefit to offset essentially a portion of your your income in that year. And so we largely benefit from um, or utilize the tax benefits of real estate. And we maximize them by using things like cost segregation studies to accelerate depreciation. And then you're able to take a large amount to offset uh, other passive income in your portfolio. But then there's also the, the aspect of debt pay down, right? So if you're uh, investing in an apartment complex, there are so many tenants in this apartment complex because again, we're utilizing leverage like we talked about. So there's this loan on it, but then these tenants are then paying down this loan for you. So there's people that are paying into your net worth every year. That's incredible. So I, I feel like that's super exciting. And then the last point is appreciation. So uh, we kind of alluded to it a little bit, but the reason why I love commercial real estate especially is because unlike single family homes or one to four unit complexes, it's not based on comparable sales of assets that have recently sold in your surroundings. You can actually control the appreciation, right? You can force the appreciation is what we call it. But essentially, kind of like we talked about that renovation story, right? We can go in and renovate something. And now, because it's a factor of net income versus capitalization rate, and there's an inverse relationship there, and because we force that net income to grow, now it's essentially like an EBITDA, right? So a five cap is equal to like a 20x uh, multiple. So if you increase your net income, or let's just say you double your net income on a 20x multiple or on a five cap in the real estate space, that is exponential growth. Yeah. And so that is very exciting. And that's, that's what gets me pumped up to do what I do every day. Um, awesome. But, but yeah, so those are just some of the benefits. And, and so I wanted to highlight those because I know a couple of them we talked about uh, and there are a few others that we briefly touched on. So, but well, thank you so much for having me today, Sam. This has been amazing. Of course, Georgia, we love having you on the podcast. And I know we're probably going to be doing this again at some point here soon uh, to just continue down this path because a lot of people ask about it. It's something that people can see. It's tangible. And we love to bring other experts who do this on a day to day. And what I also absolutely love is that you get pumped up about it, right? Like yeah. this, keep, this this stuff keeps you up at night. And that's the people that we want on this podcast to really be thinking about it. Um, but again, Giorgio, thank you so much for your time. We truly appreciate it. Thank you to all our listeners uh, for listening to us talk about real estate today. We all, we both hope you have a wonderful day. So thank you, Giorgio. Thanks, Tim. Like, like and subscribe. Thank you for taking the time to start your journey of thinking differently and listening to LBW talk about stuff they love. Until next time.